Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 12 Many years before, two whales had washed up on the sand spit. Most of the bones had been taken away to make ornaments, but ribs were still there, half buried in the sand. These I used in making the fence. One by one I dug them up and carried them to the headland. They were long and curved, and when I scooped out holes and set them in the earth, they stood taller than I did. I put the ribs together with their edges almost touching and standing so that they curved outward, which made them impossible to climb. Between them, I wove many strands of bulk kelp, which shrinks as it dries and pulls very tight. I would have used seal sinew to bind the ribs together, for this is stronger than kelp, but wild animals like it and soon would have gnawed the fence down. Much time went into this building. It would have taken me longer, except that the rock made one end of the fence and part of a side. For a place to go in and out, I dug a hole under the fence, just wide and deep enough to crawl through. The bottom and sides I lined with stones. On the outside, I covered the hole with a mat woven of brush to shed the rain, and on the inside with a flat rock, which I was strong enough to move. I was able to take eight steps between the sides of the fence, which gave me all the room I would need to store the things I gathered and wished to protect. I built the fence first because it was too cold to sleep on the rock, and I did not like to sleep in the shelter I had made until I was safe from the wild dogs. The house took longer to build than the fence because it rained many days and because the wood which I needed was scarce. There was a legend among our people that the island had once been covered with tall trees, this was a long time ago, at the beginning of the world, when Tumayoit and Mukat ruled. The two gods quarreled about many things. Tumayoit wished people to die. Mukat did not. Tumayoit angrily went down, down to another world under this world, making his belonging, taking his belongings with him, so people die because he did. In the time there were tall trees, but now there were only a few in the ravines, and these were small and crooked. It was very hard to find one that made a good pole. I searched many days, going out early in the morning and coming back at night, before I found enough for the house. I used the rock for the back of the house, and the front I left open, since the wind did not blow from this direction. The poles I made of equal length, using fire to cut them as well as a stone knife, which caused me much difficulty because I had never made such a tool before. There were four poles on each side, set in the earth, and twice that many for the roof. These I bound together with sinew and covered with female kelp, which has broad leaves. The winter was half over before I finished the house. But I slept there every night and felt secure because of the strong fence. The foxes came when I was cooking my food, and they stood outside gazing through the cracks. And the wild dogs also came, gnawing at the whale ribs, growling because they could not get in. I shot two of them, but not the leader. While I was building the fence and the house, I ate sh shellfish and perch, which I cooked on a flat rock. Afterwards, I made two utensils. Along the shore there were stones that the sea had worn smooth. Most of them were round, but I found two with hollow places in the center, which I deepened and broadened by rubbing them with sand. Using these to cook in, I saved the juices of the fish, which are good and were wasted before. For cooking seeds and roots, I wove a tight basket of fine reeds, which was easy because I had learned how to do it from my sister Ulape. After the basket had dried in the sun, I gathered lumps of pitch on the shore, softened them over the fire, and rubbed them on the inside of the basket so that it would hold water. By heating small stones and dropping them into a mixture of water and seeds in a basket, I could make gruel. I made a place for fire in the floor of my house hollowing it out and lining it with rocks. In the village of Gahalasat, we made new fires every night, 
but now I made one fire, which I covered with ashes when I went to bed. The next night, I would remove the ashes and blow in the embers. In this way, I saved myself much work. There were many gray mice on the island, and now that I had food to keep from one meal to the next, I needed a safe place to put it. On the face of the rock, which was the back wall of my house, were several cracks as high as my shoulder. These I cut out and smoothed to make shelves where I could store my food and the mice could not reach it. By the time winter was over and grass began to show green on the hills, my house was comfortable. I was sheltered from the wind and rain and prowling animals. I could cook anything I wished to eat. Everything I wanted was there at hand. It was now time to make plans for getting rid of the wild dogs which had killed my brother and would kill me should they ever come upon me unarmed. I needed another heavier spear, also a larger bow and sharper arrows. To collect the material for these weapons, I searched the whole island, making many sun, taking many suns to do it. This left only the knights to work on them. Since I could not see well by the dim fire I used for cooking, I made lamps of the dried bodies of little fish, which we call sai sai. The sai sai is the color of silver and not much bigger than a finger. On nights when the moon shines full, these little fish come swimming out of the sea in school so thick that you can almost walk on them. They come with the waves and twist and turn on the island as if they were dancing. I caught many basketfuls of sai sai and put them out in the sun. Hung up by their tails from the poles of the roof, they made much odor, but burned with a very clear light. I made the bow and arrows first and was pleased when I tried them that I could shoot further and much straighter than I had before. The spear I left to the last. I wondered as I smoothed and shaped the long handle and fitted a stone collar around the end, both to give the spear weight and to hold the spear point. If I could make this point the way the men of our tribe did, from the tooth of a sea elephant. Many nights I thought about it, wondering how I could possibly kill one of these great beasts. I could not use a net of kelp because that needed the strength of several men. Nor could I remember that a bull elephant had ever been killed with an arrow or a spear or with a spear. Only after they had been caught in a net were they killed, and then with a club. We killed many cows for their oil, using spears, but the teeth were not large. How could I do this? I did not know. Yet the more I thought about it, the greater was my determination to try, for there was nothing to be found on the island that made such good spear points as the tusk-like teeth of the bull sea elephant.